Alrighty, guys. So today we're talking about how to get started investing. And, you know, investing ultimately is the key to not being forced to work forever. So super, super crucial. Um, you know, when it comes to building wealth, your options are fairly well limited in that there are six things that you can do to get ahead with your money. You can save money in cash, you can buy shares, manage funds or ETFs, buy property, pay down debt, you can crank your super, or you can buy crypto. Um, it's the same six options that are available for everyone. Now, the first two, uh, saving money in cash and paying down debt, they're two important things to do, but they're also never going to get you rich. And it's really the other four options, buying property, buying shares, cranking your super, cryptocurrency, depending on how you feel about it. And we can talk a little bit more about that. But uh, they're the, that's, those are the investment things that are going to actually build wealth and allow your money to grow over time. They're also the things that go, you know, share markets go up, share markets go down, property does the same, super does the same. So I get that it can be scary. Um, so today, what I want to do is unpack what are the key things that you need to know to make confident decisions, smart decisions, and to get started investing sooner so that you can start, you know, building your wealth and, and making money sooner as well. Now, guys, uh, just before I, I jump into the content, please don't rush out to make any life-changing decisions off the back of what we cover. I strongly suggest you seek out personalized advice before, before jumping in. Also, uh, subtle, not subtle plug for my new book just came out uh, a bit over a month ago, Replace Your Salary by Investing. Uh, it really does go through a, an end-to-end -end game plan around uh, how to invest as well as all of the different other areas of your money that you need to get right. Uh, it's designed to ultimately help people save more and invest smarter so that they can replace their salary by investing, as the name suggests. Uh, so if you're not already around that, you should check it out um, and get, uh, yeah, it sort of dives a, a layer deeper from the stuff that we'll, we'll cover today. Also, uh, if you're about this sort of content, you can check out our other um, things. We, we've got a bunch of different content in different areas. We do a heap of events like this, which you can check out Ben Nash, Pivot Wealth on Eventbrite if you're not familiar with those already. Mo Money Podcast on all of your podcast platforms uh, and socials, Ben Talks Money on TikTok, Pivot Ben, and there's a bunch of stuff on the Pivot Wealth website as well. Um, so look, getting into it when it comes to saving, I, I was just recently looking at some stats for some other content and I found that in Australia, our, currently our household savings rate is low four and a half percent on the average income that works out to be about $80 per week. Now I think it's possible to save more. In fact, when, uh, the last couple of years, the high point of our household savings rate was 23.8%. So I know that that's possible, but even at $80 a week, I had a look and said, what, if you were to save that money in cash versus invest it into shares, what does that actually look like? And over a 30 year period, you end up with an additional half a million dollars almost from investing into shares versus just saving your money in a bank account. But I get that it's really can be quite scary and it's everyone knows that we, that we should invest, that we need to invest, but the stats show us that 54%, so over half of Australians, do not have any investments outside of their compulsory superannuation fund or their uh, and or their own home. Now, why is that? Well, look, everyone's situation is unique, but I found that there are three common challenges that really do hold people back in this space. The first is information overload. It's like there's so, so many options, so much information like you're drinking from the fire hose. Second is people struggle to find the right balance between how do you get ahead with your money at a rate that you're happy with and live a good lifestyle at the same time. That balance is important to find, but it's also not easy to find. And the third is FOMO, the bit of the fear of missing out, but the fear of making a mistake is just as important here where you don't want to do something dumb that ends up costing you a bunch of money. So what happens is you end up doing nothing and you end up stuck, not not always stuck doing nothing, but sometimes you're just stuck doing the same thing that you've been doing in the past and you're missing the opportunity to be getting more out of the money that you've already got. So what I've found is that there's three areas that you need to get right. Your structure, strategy, and solutions. Structure is about making it easy to save and manage your money and making it clear how much money you've got to work with when it comes to investing and building wealth for the future. That ties in with the next element, which is your strategy. And that's really getting clear on the best pathway to take you from where you are now to success with your money. Do you buy shares? Do you buy property? Do you crank your super? Do you do some sort of combination? Really nailing that down. And then the third is investments. And that's what we're going to be diving deep into today. The investments and the product solutions that you use to back up your strategy and get you reliable, consistent progress over time and avoid the downsides and setbacks and those momentum killing mistakes. Now, if any one of these three elements is missing, 
it ends up blowing up the others. If you don't have a good structure in place, you're working with leaky bucket, hard to make good investment decisions. If you don't have a good strategy in place, you're going to be facing a bunch more risk. You're also going to be leaving a bunch of money on the table. If you don't have good investments, you're going to blow up your cash. It's pretty obvious. So all three areas are areas that you need to get right. Today, we're diving deep into solutions, but be aware that the other two are just as important because a common myth, and I don't actually think I've got this in the slide, maybe I do, but I don't think I do, that a lot of people fall into the myth or the, the thinking trap that choosing good investments will get you rich. But being successful with your money is about so much more than just choosing good investments. You've got to be investing the right amount at the right time. You've got to be smart with your tax. You've got to manage your risk. You've got to do all of these different things. Choosing good investments is important, but it's absolutely not enough. I wanted to share... Um, I wanted to share a story from a recent client that was doing some inefficient investing and what they did so that you can start to get a sense of what some of the things that you might maybe should be thinking about. Now, this is a couple that are in their early 30s. Combined income was $260,000. They had 370 k in net assets, of which a large chunk was sitting in an investment portfolio. They were saving three grand a month. A thousand was going to cash and two grand was going to ETFs. Now, these guys, they really wanted to buy their dream home from memory, it was a bit over one and a half million dollars was the number that they had in mind. But they felt that that was really far away. Like that's a really big mortgage. They needed a big deposit to get there. And it just wasn't sort of stacking up. They were doing some investing, but they didn't have confidence in what they're doing because they didn't really have a deep understanding of the where the risk was coming from and what could have gone wrong. So they were a little bit uncertain, frustrated with tax and felt they were missing a trick. Now, what we ended up doing when we when they went through the planning and decision making process, we found that one the it's actually the lady had a much higher income than the gentleman and but all the investments because she was more focused on investments she'd set up the investment account in her name and she was getting stung with a bunch of extra tax on the investment income um, more than they needed to so they switched the investments over to the partner's name the same time they used the first home super saver scheme to contribute money to their super to then take the money out to uh, use as a deposit for their own home saved six and a half grand in tax in the first year as a result of those two things and invested an extra $60,000, partly from the cash savings that they had, partly from their regular savings moving forward. Now, they were stoked with this as an outcome. And we, I think we we're all you know, pretty happy with how it turned out. But what I did, I, I, I'm a curious sort of guy. So I started looking into it and said, how, how did this play out? Because this is something that they'd thought about and sort of um, started the process of thinking about on getting in the front foot with their investing and their planning a couple of years ago. So I thought, I wonder how much that lost time actually cost them. So I looked at their wealth, how their wealth position was expected to grow by age 60, which was an additional 937,000 happy days. But then I started looking at what happened if they, what would have happened if they'd started two years sooner and saw that the difference was an extra, oh, lost my camera. Uh, the difference between the wealth outcomes was actually an extra $200,000 as a result of those, um, of making those changes. So that that's the two year, that's the opportunity cost. And this for me is why it's so important to really be on the front foot with your investing because everyone thinks about it. You think you should do it. Then time goes on and all the while you're missing the opportunity to actually get the results, but you're actually crystallizing an opportunity cost that you can never get back because once those two years are gone, you actually, you can catch up a little bit, but you can't actually make up for the, the amount of money that you've missed. And it's not just how much money you won't have 12 months from now if you don't get started today. It's then that extra amount, how much that would grow to be worth for you in a year's time, 10 years time, 20 years time, 30 years time. And this is why it's so important. So firstly, well done on being here today to get on the front foot with this stuff. But what my advice would be, um, my general advice would be that, make the time to make this happen off the back of whatever the actions are for you, whatever your next steps are, be clear on what they are, make a date with yourself to make it happen because it will make you serious money in getting this right. Getting get into investing basics, but I just got a question here that's come through that says, do you have any advice to on how to deal with the tax deductions when managing selling shares? Uh, I'm maybe... I'm not 100% clear on 
exactly what the question is here, but tax, maybe tax implications when selling shares. So when you buy shares for a price and then you sell them for a, a price, ideally a gain in the future, that is a capital gain, which is then taxable to you. And, and essentially what happens, and I've actually got a section to go through on tax, but in Australia, you only get one tax rate. So one tax rate, which includes your um, all of your employment income, but also any dividend income from your share portfolio, interest income from your bank account, and capital gains income, they all add up together and then you pay tax as per where, wherever your assessable income lands at, in the marginal tax brackets. So if you were to, say, make a $10,000 taxable capital gain when you sell investments, then you've got $10,000 more income that's going to be taxable at your marginal tax rate. If you earn more than $45,000, that's going to be 34.5% at least. I've got all the brackets broken down, so don't feel like you need to remember this. But um, you're going to be paying at least a third if you earn more than 45 k potentially up to 47% if you're in the top marginal tax bracket. That means that the deductions are going to be more valuable to you um, when you're realizing these gains from investment income. Um, so, yeah, I, I suppose that you want to understand where you can be saving tax and knowing how to maximize your deductions. I've I'll direct you to some recent content, but on my TikTok, if you're interested in this stuff, I put out a bunch of recent content, given that we're coming up to tax time about how you can maximize your deductions before the end of the financial year. So I hope that answers the question. Let me know if, if I'm misunderstanding or misinterpreting that question, and I'm happy to, uh, happy to get into it in a bit more detail as well. So investment basics uh, or investing basics, I wanted to frame this up with a bit of an example showing the power of time, because I think a lot of people think that you need to have a lot of money to get started investing, but you really don't. Um, the, a little bit done consistently over a long time makes you some serious money. So what I've got, I've got an example here that has you saving and investing $1,000 every month and investing it into the share market, assuming the long-term average on the Australian share market, which is 9.8%. I'll unpack exactly what those investments are later in this section of the of the talk. But for now, you should know that the long-term return of the share market is something that's actually quite easy for everyone to um, achieve and doesn't involve uh, picking the next Afterpay or Google or Microsoft or, you know, whatever. So how it works. You save $1,000 every month for the 12 months of the year, $12,000 a year. Over a 10-year period, you would have saved $120,000 and invested. But over that period, you would have got some dividends on your shares, some income from the share portfolio, and some growth on the investments over uh, over time. So the 120, you would have put in 120, but the growth, the extra uplift that you've got would be around 82,000, such that if you'd done this 10 years ago, your portfolio would be worth about $202,000 today. Ma says time in the market, not time in the market, absolutely spot on. You see though, that as you keep this going for more time to Ma's comment there as well, that the, the returns start to really compound over time. So after 20 years, you put in a total of 240000 but your portfolio has grown now to be worth $740,000, basically made half a million dollars from the two hundred and forty k on so half a million dollars on top of the two hundred and forty thousand that you've put in. After thirty years, you put in three hundred and sixty k, but you've now got two point one million. That's like you've made one point eight million dollars from a three hundred and sixty thousand dollar investment. That's pretty good, Vicky's in anyone's view. And then forty years, four hundred eighty thousand, five point nine million. You basically like five and a half million dollars of upside that you've made, which is like a. Um, it's a 10x return on your investment, over 10x return on your investment. And that's what a lot of people think that you need to invest crazy amounts, but you don't. You just need to keep it consistent. And, um, you know, getting started sooner is really valuable. So I've compared this, uh, the first ex example to uh, another very common scenario that I see where people think about investing, but they ultimately don't invest. And then they wait and they wait, you know, you might sit on your hands for 10 years, then you finally uh, get things cr rocking and rolling. You see that then you invest the exact same amount of money, but the difference between how much you end up with is really massive. So after 20 years, the difference is half a million dollars. After 30 years, it's one and a half million dollars. After 40 years, 
it's almost $4 million difference from just starting sooner. Now, the difference, the amount that you've invested differently, you've invested $120,000 less here. But the diff, like I say, half a million, to one and a half million, $4 million, massive, massive uh, difference there in the outcome. So the sooner you start, the easier it is. And you have to get started with this stuff. It will not just happen on its own. Ultimately, fear leads it to inaction and missed opportunities. And I see, I see fear. There's a lot of barriers to investing success, but fear of making a mistake is probably the biggest one that I see. So that's what I want to help you push through. I'm going to dive into the basics so that you can understand where risk is coming from and think about how you can actually manage it. Now, the first important thing that you need to know when it comes to investing is growth investments versus defensive investments and choosing the right split between these to give you the outcomes that you want. Defensive investments are like investments like cash and fixed interest, which is like bonds and term deposits. They're called defensive investments because they're much less likely to go backwards in value. In fact, cash in Australia, government guaranteed up to $250,000, basically 0% chance of, of losing money up to that government guaranteed level. The defensive investments are also income investments in that they're, designed, they're not designed to grow. They're designed to generate you an income. You put cash in the bank account. Your dollar never grows to be worth more than a dollar. Your dollar generates an income return, an interest return that you then put next to the first dollar. And then, it, and then that's how you make the money, essentially. That compares to growth investments, which is property, residential and commercial property, Australian shares and international shares, where those investments are designed to grow into the future. You buy a share or a property for a certain amount of money today in 10 years time, so long as you've chosen a good one, you'd expect that to be worth more. So choosing the right split between your defensive investments and growth investments is all important. Now, defensive or defensive investments and particularly cash, in my opinion, Really, really crucial because that's what gives you peace of mind. That is your safety net. With cash, you know, if you've got money sitting in a cash in an emergency account, you know that you'll be able to draw on that tomorrow. If you've got money that's uh, the only money that you've got is sitting in shares, excuse me, if the share market goes down and then you need money, you could be forced to sell investments at a loss and then you're really, you're actually losing money. Whereas if you've got your emergency reserves to draw on and the share market goes down and something goes wrong, you draw on your cash, you can leave your money, your share money invested until markets recover and then you ultimately make money. So in my view, and I, do I have this on a slide? I think I've got it on a future slide, but in my view, understanding how much cash you need as your emergency fund and as your fallback buffer is something that's really crucial before you get started investing. But then if you're looking to invest, I think that, that the money that you're then investing is money that should be invested into growth investments because that if you're in, you're at, you're ultimately investing for the growth. So I see some people when they get started investing and they might choose a balanced investment option, which is like half defensive, half growth. And then they've still got their emergency fund put aside. In, in my view, that means you're probably a little bit overweight defensive investments. So something to think about. Timeline is really important though, and I sort of touched on this already, that when you're investing, there are two things that you need to do to get good results from your investments, to make money from your investments over time. The first is that you need to choose good investments, and I'm going to unpack exactly how you can do that. The second is that you need to make sure that you're never forced to sell investments at a time that doesn't make sense. You think about the COVID market meltdown, the Eurozone crisis that happened in 2015, the financial crisis that happened in 2008. Now, at those times, even good quality companies, good, good investments, which I don't know why I'm doing that because they are actually good investments, uh, they all went down in value and they went down significantly. If you were forced to sell investments at that time, you would have crystallized at loss. But if you weren't forced to sell and you just held them for longer, you would wait and then the market would recover. And now all of those investments are much, much higher than what they were during those low points. The suggested investment timeframe for share type investments is seven to 10 years or more. The reason that they say that is because if the markets have a significant downturn, then they may be down for, for a number of years. So if you know when you invest that you can afford to leave the money there for that seven to 10 year or more time frame, you know that you'll be able to wait out market conditions until they recover and ultimately take a profit from your investments. 
This is really important. Where I see people go wrong, sometimes I see people do things like saving money for their kids' school fees through a micro-investing account. Now, what that actually means is that you're, you've got your money invested in shares such that if the share market starts going down, you could be forced and you have to pay the school fees, you're forced to sell your investments at a loss, total nightmare. So again, you, your timeline here is all important. Now, when you're investing, if you're investing for the long term, for me, as I said, that those investments should be growth. You want to make sure that you've got your cash covered for your short term emergencies. For mine, and this depends on the individual and how you feel about this stuff, but I'm not big on term deposits or bond funds or those sorts of things, even though I know that they can deliver a little bit higher return than cash and still be fairly defensive. But for me, cash is king. And I want to know that my emergency fund is readily available and accessible. Um, beyond that, though, all of my money I want to be invested that is for investing, I want to be invested in growth investments. Australian shares and international shares are important because Aussie, Aussie shares are important because we live in Australia, but international shares are also important because Australia is a small part of a global investment um, market. So having a mixture of both is, is quite important, in my opinion. The next thing that you need to know is good risk versus bad risk or small company versus big company risk. So what I've got on this slide is I've, I've contrasted the return profile on two different companies. Now, company one, you can see does have ups and downs, but it's a little bit more of a, more of a smoother line. You could think of this like the Commonwealth Bank. Commonwealth Bank is one of the largest companies in Australia. It's been around for 100 plus years. Uh, it's got a lot of assets, a lot of different income streams, good track record. It's still going to go up and down based on what's happening in the world and what's happening in the markets and how the company is performing. But over time, the return is smoother. Company two, you could consider this as like a tech startup company or a mining startup, mining exploration company that's hoping to um, really make it big. You see that the return profile, it's a smaller company, less assets behind it, less stable income streams. So the returns are going to be a bit more wild, big ups, big downs. Have they made it? No, they haven't. Have they made it? No, they haven't. Uh, and what happens is that they, they end up either shooting the lights out or going bust. But the, the most common scenario is that the they underperform or perform averagely. Most startup companies do. When you get into the bigger companies, though, I see this as a more premium investment, what you would call a blue chip investment, which just means basically premium big company that they give you a lot more stability. Now, when you look at the long-term share market return, that return is driven mainly by the bigger companies, not so much the smaller companies. So you don't, while it's appealing to shoot the lights out with, uh, you know, some startup investment that makes you a bunch of money, you don't need that extra level of risk and you, you don't need that extra level of return rather and in my view, you probably don't want the extra risk that comes with it as well. So when you're investing, a lot of people, particularly if you don't have a lot of experience with investing, people will think that it when you start investing into more growth investments, it means that you're getting more of these smaller speculative investments in your portfolio. But it doesn't mean that at all. It just means that you've got more share investments in your portfolio and less defensive or bond investments in your portfolio. So good versus bad risk is all important. The small company risk, in my view, you just absolutely do not need it. If you want it, you can, but you probably don't need it. Be aware that high return does mean high risk. And anytime you're investing, thinking that you're going to make a whole bunch of money, that the investment could shoot the lights out, that means that you're also facing a higher level of risk. I think it's important for any investor, even if I think if you're particularly interested in startup investing or small company investing, then you can do that once you've built a foundation of your of, of wealth and foundation of investments without jeopardizing your um, your how your wealth will build over time. So my take is that you really like only if you're interested in the small companies, the more speculative investments. Put your foundations in place first with some boring investments that you know you can sleep like a baby at night and they will go up over the long term. And then when you get to a certain point, you can start directing a small portion of your investments into these more speculative investments. And I would put crypto in that space as much as I like crypto. It is a high risk, high potential return, but high risk type investment. 
So where people go wrong, they put too much into this at the start. They put too much into the speculative stuff. And then if it goes wrong, they're having to go back to the starting line. Now, diversification is another key risk management strategy. Uh, diversification simply means spreading your risk between multiple investments. So in this slide, I've got company one, company two. You can think of those as two big blue chip premium companies. Think of it like Commonwealth Bank and Woolworths. Now, the return profile is going to be up and down on both of them because they obviously they follow the market returns, but it's going to be more stable over time. Now, if you were to get $10,000 and put half into Commonwealth Bank and half into Woolworths, the return that you're going to get is going to be the average of the two returns uh, over time. And you see that that's the dashed line that I've got here in this uh in the in the slide here you see that that line is actually smoother than any like than either company one or company two the more that's in diversifying with two investments if you put 20 200 2000 in your portfolio the return gets smoother and smoother and the more diversified you are the less your overall investment return is dependent on the return of any one particular investment in your portfolio. So diversification is really an important and super effective risk management strategy. Um, and for mine, I think that, you know, particularly when you're getting started investing, you want to try and be diversifying a lot and doing it early. It does mean that you won't shoot the lights out, but it also means that if one company in your portfolio goes bust, it's going to have less of an impact on your, on your overall investment performance. Now, I've got a slide up here showing the overall share market in Australia. And I want to talk about active and passive investing, but I'm going to start by explaining what the actual market itself is. Now, ASX 200 is the 200 largest companies in Australia. That's like if you see the news at night and they say the ASX has gone up by 1% or down by 1%. What they're referring to is the index of the 200 largest companies in the country or all companies in the country. I'll just use a 200 here because it's the easiest one to explain. So with the ASX 200, if you added up the value of the 200 largest companies in Australia or when I did it to, um, to put together this slide, the combined value of these companies was $1.67 trillion. We know what each of the companies is worth because it's all publicly traded information. And what we can do is figure out what is the proportion for each company of the overall share market. So we know the Commonwealth Bank being worth $200 billion equates to be about 8.9% of the total ASX 200, the total, the 200 largest companies. All of the other companies are in there. And so what an index fund does is it just replicates the exact percentages, the exact proportions of these companies and invests a pool of money in exactly the same percentages as the overall share market. And what that means is that the return on an index fund is going to be essentially equal to the return on the market. There is a very, very small tracking error, which is why I caveat with the word essentially. Um, but it, what it means is that it's almost, it's pretty much bang on, meaning that an index fund will give you the market return. And when I said that that market return is easy for anyone to achieve, this is how you do it. If you want the share market, if you want the Australian share market return, all you need to do is buy an Australian share index fund, Australian share index ETF, and Australian share index micro investing option. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, the actual options there and how you can choose as well. Now that compares to um, uh, active funds, which I'll I'll touch on in a sec. But sorry, just wrapping with the index fund benefits or passive index fund benefits. They're highly diversified. So if you buy an index fund or an index fund ETF, you buy one investment and in turn invest in 200 plus different companies. So highly diversified. They're also very low cost because all the, all the index fund is doing is tracking the overall share market return. So it's not like they're having to pay some Ferrari driving fund manager to you know, read the future in tea leaves or whatever. 
it takes a lot less time to manage with an index fund because you know that you're getting the market return. And ultimately, you have really solid peace of mind. The only way that an index fund can go to zero is if every single company in the country goes bust at the same time. And if that happens, I can tell you, you're going to have bigger problems than your investment portfolio. So for me, I think index funds are, are pretty solid um, and a great place to start for anyone that's looking to get started investing. I'll go through some of the stats in terms of how these two stack up in a sec as well. The alternative to a passive index fund is an actively managed fund. And with an active fund, you see that it's a fund manager, a research house, a computer algorithm sometimes, and they're trying to figure out what is going to be the best thing that they can invest money in to make the most amount of money. So the returns, the, the investments that they choose and the returns that they get are going to be different to the share market. That's by nature of the fund that they have to be different. The thing, the issue with active funds is a couple, but they're, they are well diversified. So with an active fund, you can buy one fund and you're investing in a whole bunch of different underlying companies. They do have the potential for outperformance. So if they get it right, if they get the decisions right, an active fund can perform better than the market. And they can also be good if you're at retirement, getting close to or in retirement, because they can have what's called a negative correlation or have different investments that provide a smoother return over time. But the downsides of, of active funds, well, firstly, is the performance. Index funds perform better more than 82% of the time in Australia. So that means that you've got a less than a one in five chance if you're choosing an active fund that your fund will perform as well or better than the overall share market. So I would say sort of like, why would you, why would you do that? Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, it, it's, this number actually increases the longer you look out because with an active fund, some of them get it right for a short amount of time but by making a few good calls, but it's very difficult for them to consistently do that over the long term. So when you're investing, once you understand, you know, diversification, big company risk, small company risk, that you need to choose whether you want to invest actively or passively. Now, this sort of beyond the scope of what we're covering today, but ethical investing is, is something that's getting more and more attention and for good reason in Australia. They do have ethical index funds and active ethical funds. So you can have a, a passive index fund that is ethical, or a, a, which just means that it's got a screen on it where it will screen out certain companies, or you can have a non-ethical index fund, which is just the entire market. Similarly, with active funds, you can have active ethical or just active without the ethical screens in place. But essentially choosing between these four options is one of the most important decisions that you need to make in the early days of getting started investing. And once you choose, once you make this choice, that's going to direct what investment uh, accounts, what investment solutions are going to make the most sense for you. So that's an important thing that you need to decide on. The next stage is how you're going to access how, how, what sort of investments you're going to use to actually invest. And that's deciding between investing in shares directly, managed funds, ETFs, or micro investing. Again, four options there. I'm going to unpack each of them in turn. Now with share investments, when you buy a share in a company, you own a, a small slice of that company. So if you buy a share in the Commonwealth Bank, you're going to own a tiny little percentage of the Commonwealth Bank. You'll be entitled to a share of the profit that the company generates, as well as the growth in the value of those shares over time. The good thing about share investing in Australia is that um, when it when dividends are paid, so when the income is paid out from a share investment, if it's with bigger companies, most of them have what's called franking credits or tax credits attached to them. So if you think of Commonwealth Bank, again, as an example, that they make half of, uh, they make $5 billion in profit in a six month period, they will pay tax on that profit. They keep part of the profit to reinvest in the business. And then they pay out part of the profit as a dividend to the shareholders. Because that profit is paid out after CBA pays tax on their profit, that means that they, when you receive that dividend as income, as a dividend check or, you know, into your account or whatever, 
you will get a little tax credit from the ATO for the tax that CBA has already been uh, already paid on the money. Because the company tax rate is sort of close to 30%, that means that the income is essentially already being taxed at 30%. So when you pay tax on it, you only have to pay potentially a little bit of top up tax if your tax rate is higher than 30%. Or if your tax rate is lower than 30%, you actually get a tax refund based on that, which is quite cool as well. That's why super funds get a tax refund of franking credits when you invest in shares through your super fund. Now, with the share investments, another big advantage is that you have a bit more control of the companies that you can choose because you are literally choosing specific companies and you're only investing into the companies that you believe in, that you think are good investments that you want to have in your investment portfolio. But the flip side of that is that you're, when you invest in shares, your investments are generally going to be less diversified because you're only choosing a small number of companies. And even if you had 20 shares in your portfolio, which would be that, you know, a pretty significant amount of money, particularly if you're getting started investing, pre pretty significant number of shares to be investing into, you're still going to be not that diversified when you compare it to an index fund or an index ETF where you've got one investment that invests in 200 plus other investments. So that's share investment. Um, got a question here. It says, you mentioned the benefits of index funds. But what are the negatives, if any? Uh, look, yeah, they're sorry. They're, I shouldn't have glossed over that. There, there certainly are. With an index fund, you know that your return is going to be the market return, and so you. That means that you're you're not going to shoot the lights out. So you think of like the afterpay success story, which is one that comes to mind. You benefit when you're in an index fund. Index fund members benefited from the rise in value of Afterpay because as Afterpay got bigger, it made up a bigger proportion of the index and therefore was uh, contributing to the index fund returns. But you would have missed the hyper growth in the earlier stages because it would have been a really tiny little percentage of the overall share market at that time. So on the flip side is if you're picking direct shares like what I'm talking about here that you can choose companies and potentially shoot the lights out. Very difficult to do and certainly very, very difficult to do consistently, but that's something that you don't get with an index fund. Um, to be honest, beyond that, uh, you know, the, it, yeah, it's, it's, they're, they're not sexy. Maybe that's a downside as well. It's not that interesting or exciting, although I think making money is exciting. So that, that's, that certainly uh, scratches the itch for me. But uh, I would say that that's probably the biggest downside is that you don't have that single company exposure and potential for upside returns. I don't think you need it, but it is a downside that's there. Another question here that says, uh, got a, this is a question from James says, my investment income is taxed at 32.5% plus Medicare levy, but also my wife and I lose 20 cents in the dollar for government benefits. So any realized investment gains result in less than 50% in my pocket. Do you have suggestions for good investment strategies with such a high taxation real estate? Um, yeah, interesting question, James. Look, uh, yeah, a little bit of a curly one. I would say, look, firstly, like paying tax obviously sucks, uh, although it's important on some sort of societal level for sure. In my view, you don't want to pay any more than you have to. But ultimately, if you're paying tax on investment income, you are um, making money. So that's a good thing. That's what you're trying to do when you invest. So that's probably just a reframing your, your thinking about this. But I certainly get that you know, losing a third of it in tax and then the and then losing more in, in government benefits that that, uh, that is painful. Now, you one thing to think about, and, and this is something when we're constructing portfolios, that you generally, you, you realise gains on investments when you sell them. And some investments are good for income and some investments are good for growth. So for example... Australian shares generally pay a higher dividend than US shares. In Australia, we've got this, it's partly like the self-funded retiree, like how things are set up, but the average dividend yield in Australia is like four and a half percent. And then you've got franking on top. So it's actually closer to sort of 5%. If you compare that to US shares, the average income yield on an invest, uh, the average dividend payout on a US share 
is closer to 2%. For some of the bigger companies, it's actually much lower than that. Because in America, they tend to hold on to the profits to reinvest them in more growth in the company. And then you get more of a growth return on your investments and less of an income return on your investments. This, the overall return is about the same. The Australian share long-term return, 9.8%. For the US, it's a bit over 10%. So it's, it's basically the same. But in Australia, you get more in income. That suggests that if you've got and where you're trying to manage the amount of realized income and realized gains, if you bought a share that, say, only had growth investments and wasn't paying you an income, you wouldn't ever have to pay tax on that growth until you sell the investments, it, with the exception of Labor's insane superannuation uh, cap plan that they've just put into place. But that's a bit of a bugbear of mine and a bit of an aside. But um, essentially outside of that, which is what you're talking about. If your shares are just increasing in value because you're not selling them and you're not realizing a capital gain and because they're not paying you an income, then you wouldn't have as much assessable income while you're still making the same amount of money from your portfolio. You wouldn't have the same amount of assessable income coming in. Don't know if that, like, obviously you want to make sure that your investments are structured in a way that you, you wouldn't want to just invest in US shares just for that reason. But you know, that it, there is an argument that you should have US shares. So maybe if that's structured in the right way, that could give you a benefit. Hope that helps, James. Uh, all right. So manage funds. Manage funds are the next uh, type. Now, these are historically really common, but it's essentially a pool of share investments. So it's like a big pool of investors get together and they go buy a whole bunch of shares. Uh, managed funds are, uh, have a benefit over direct shares in my view. Well, they have a benefit over direct shares in anyone's opinion that they are more diversified because you're buying one managed fund and it's investing into multiple investments, generally dozens, sometimes hundreds, sometimes even thousands. Because you're investing through a managed fund, your costs are going to be lower. So, for example, you've got a, um, a direct share portfolio and you're investing in 20 individual companies, you're going to have to pay 20 times brokerage to buy your 20 shares. Through a managed fund, because they've got so many investors, they're getting cheaper brokerage, investing bigger amounts at a time, so the costs end up being a lot lower. One of the downsides, though, with managed funds is that the tax consequences are pooled. So what that means is that if you're in a pool with other investors and some of them bought in when markets are low and they sell when markets are high, if you're in the pool with them, the gains are distributed across all members equally, even though you might have came in already when markets are high. That means you get a little bit less control over the tax consequences with a managed fund compared to a share or an ETF, which I'll talk about in a sec. Some of the providers, and this is getting better, but they're, they're heavier on administration. You have to, there are forms and stuff. Vanguard are probably the ones that do it better the most. Um, and I think it is improving, but historically it's been pretty heavy on an admin perspective. There can sometimes be, or there often is minimum investments for managed funds as well in the maybe 500 or thousand dollars. But if you're just getting started, that can be a little bit prohibitive as well. Next one, ETFs. ETFs have been become insanely popular. And for pretty good reason, they're pretty easy to access. There's a bunch of interesting ones that are out there. It's sort of like a share that you buy on, you know, Comsec or Selfwealth or Perler or whatever share platform that you would have, but it gives you access to something that's sort of like a managed fund. But it's a little bit different to a managed fund in that with an ETF, say you've got an ASX 200 ETF, when you buy that ETF, you end up with a tiny little slice of 200 companies. With an ETF, though, unlike a managed fund, if you hold that that same um, ETF for the long term and the market doesn't change composition, you don't realize any capital gains until you sell. Different from a managed fund where when other people are buying and selling, that can create tax consequences that flow through to you. So it does give you a little bit more control over tax. They are nice and diversified like a managed fund, but with an ETF, you do have to pay brokerage costs as well. You buy an ETF, you have to pay a trade fee. They're getting cheaper and cheaper, which is great, but the costs are definitely there. Micro investing is another area where it's typically used through an app. Um, uh, Perla, Raise, Stockspot, Spaceship, 
they're some of the popular ones that are out there. Basically, they give you access to fractions of shares, managed funds, and or ETFs. And they the micro investments are great for a couple of reasons. One, though, if, particularly if you're getting started investing, that they let you start with as little as one single cent, some of the platforms. Most of them, it's a $5 minimum. The fees are generally lower because they're built for people that have smaller investment balances or getting started investing. They also, the really big benefit that I see is that they have a solid focus on user experience. They are easy, the UX that's here. They, you can literally just set it up on your phone, you download it and you're investing in under 10 minutes once you do the ID verification piece um, and super easy for automated investing, which I think is something that's really important for any regular investors. So yeah, I, I think micro investing can be great. And what I would say with all of those options, shares, managed funds, ETFs and micro, in Australia, the APRA, APRA is the Australian Prudential Regulatory Authority. They're the ones that oversee financial markets. And one of their key mandates is making sure that people don't lose money when they invest. So when, um, when you're investing with these companies, so long as they have a product disclosure statement and a financial services guide, I'm not saying you need to read it, although you probably should read it, but uh, pretty dry and boring. But having those things in place means that they're regulated and protected under APRA. And it means that all of those companies, if, if any one of them was to go bust tomorrow, investors' money is not mixed in with the operating funds of the business. Instead, they're just providing administration services for your investments. The reason that I put this slide in is to say that if you find a product, if you find a product or an investment account that you think is good and they're regulated under APRA and have these things in place, you don't need to stress about the fact that it's a startup company and that your money is at risk because it's not. Your risk sits with the investments that you choose. If you choose bad investments, that can lose your money. But if you choose a bad company to administrate your investments, that's generally you've got the APRA protections in place. With You've got to choose ultimately between do you use shares, managed funds, ETFs or micro. And I will just say that if you've got less than $200,000 in your investment portfolio, the actual dollar return differences from a tax perspective, from a fees perspective, and from a returns perspective are going to be very small in a dollar sense. So I speak to a lot of people that they see all these things and there's so much information online and I've just thrown a bunch of information at you here. But the reality is if you're getting started and if you're getting started investing with $50, you're not going to notice the difference between a return on a managed fund and an ETF or a direct share that much really or a micro investing platform. So you should you should always make sure you're getting the best thing. But I think at the start, you focus on a solution that's easy and then you can get started and you can change things over time. Now, mine, micro investing is an easy starting point for a lot of people, particularly if you're starting with lower numbers because you can set it up quickly, easy to automate, whatever. ETFs are the, probably the next step up, a little bit more involved, but a little bit more choice and a little bit more admin, a little bit harder. Manage funds for me, I don't, I stay away from them unless you're buying on a platform, which again is complicated and a little bit expensive, admin heavy, the tax consequences don't like it. Shares are only really for active investors, firstly, and advanced investors beyond that. And I think for anyone that's looking to get started investing, you will change it later. So get started and then get it done, like get it done, get started investing and then review when you get to 10,000, review when you get to 50,000, review when you get to 100,000, but don't let trying to find the perfect solution stop you from getting that first 5,000 because it's so easy for time to go on and the opportunity cost just starts cranking up. So uh, got a question, negative of micro investing. Mm. Look, sometimes the costs can be higher if you've literally got $5 in your account. Uh, the cost can be higher in a percentage because a lot of them will charge like a dollar or $2 a month as an admin fee. So that's a downside. For me, I think that cost is worth it for a lot of people though. Um, I know that I did that when I set up some accounts for my kids a while back. Uh, I was happy to pay that because I had a solution that was easy for me to run little bit of control that the, some of the options are limited. You, you don't get the same control that you get with an ETF or a managed fund. Um, they're the big ones that I can think of. Hope that helps. I'm sure maybe do some research online and, and I'm sure there'll probably be a couple more ones that will come up, but they're the two impactful ones that I think. 
So guys, uh, this is where the rubber hits the road, the steps. The steps, once you've chosen your investment strategy, that will narrow the list of the products that you should, that make sense. You make the choice there, then you open your account, choose your provider and open your account with them. Choose your investments for future contributions. So typically with, if you're trying to set up an automatic investment plan, which is the next step, you wanna choose how your future money will be invested. Then set up a regular investment plan. And for me, this is really, really crucial, even if the amount is small. And I wrote about, write about this in my book, that if you start literally investing $5 a week this week, I can guarantee you that in three months' time, you're going to be investing more than $5 a week because you're going to be paying attention. You're going to check out the app. You're going to see some stuff happening. And then you're going to... Um, ultimately start doing more and start building your momentum and that that that's it that has you as an investor now uh i am going to give you the really quick version of investing tax because i'm just a little bit mindful of time here i would say that tax when it comes to investing is the biggest opportunity and the biggest potential roadblock the only thing that you should really care about from your investment is your after tax investment return you only get one tax rate, as I touched on. And in Australia, we've got these marginal tax rates where the first $18,000, you don't pay any tax. Then $18,045, you pay at $0.19, cents, then 34%, 39%, and 47%, above $180,000. You only get one tax rate. So for all your salary income plus investment income and gains, et cetera. So they all add together and then you get taxed at your marginal tax rate. That means the more you earn, the more um, tax that you pay. But all entities are not taxed in the same rate. So if you think of like a family group, you could have yourself, your partner. So you might have two different tax rates. That means there's a tax variance there. You can also invest through your super fund. You can invest through a company that's a bit more of an advanced strategy, or you can invest through a trust. And again, they have different tax rates. Now, for a lot of wealthy people, if you're looking to build significant wealth over time, that they end up using a trust and investment company structure, which means that you don't need to pay more than 30% tax on your investment income using this structure. I've looked at what this means that on $100,000 of investment income, getting tax at the company tax rate at 30% versus tax at the top marginal tax rate will save you $17,000 in interest every year, in tax every year. $17,000 a year in less tax that's more $17,000 that you can use to grow your investments faster. Now, this is an advanced strategy. It's not for everyone. And it's only when you've got enough money and, and in your investment portfolio that makes it worthwhile. But I wanted to plant the seeds here because the tax savings can be really significant. I will say that the tax impact, like with the choosing between a managed fund and an ETF and a micro investing account, the difference is really small in the early stages, but as your portfolio builds, the implications build, the tax impact actually builds more as well. So you want to make sure that when you're um, when you're investing, that, that you, you're planning with your tax at the start, but also you don't want that to be the big barrier that stops you from getting started. So like with your investing, check in on it when you get to 50K. Um, get started investing, but then check in on it at 10K, check in on it at 50K. Then you've actually got some things in place and you can re, um, you know, restructure things and, and optimize from there. Now, uh, myths and mistakes I wanted to cover off. Some of the things that can hold people back around investing. Don't have or earn enough money to invest, comma, myth. Look, like I touched on, micro investing starts as little as one single cent. Um, so that really anyone has enough money to invest. Doing anything here will feel like progress and you, you'll you join. Like all you have to do is invest five bucks and then you're you're doing better than one in two Australians because, because there's over 50% of Aussies don't have any investments at all outside their super fund and home. So, you know, that's going to make you feel good. And then you start increasing over time. Worried about choosing bad investments that will fail? Look, you can buy a slice of the whole share market. Use a passive fund. I think that's a great way to get started. This is not financial advice. You should confirm with your financial advice professional. But uh, for me, I'm like, that's a, a bit of a no-brainer if you're worried about choosing bad investments that will fail. Um, not trusting the stock market. I get that if you don't have experience in it, but often it's just about understanding the risks and how you can actually manage them. Goals too far away seems impossible and pointless. I totally get that. And particularly high cost of living, unaffordable properties, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is that 
we underestimate how much results we can create over the long term by just being consistent. So take action now and start building momentum. And look, if you feel apathetic and you don't do anything, you're just going to have to do more later or sacrifice more later. It's as simple as that. Unknown unknowns. Yeah, again, you just need to uplift your money knowledge and having flexibility to change. You just need to build that into your plan. Uh, investing going to be complicated and confusing. Look, it can be. It can be, but it can also be simple when you know what are the important things to focus on. So here you want to automate your investing and you can set things up where you shouldn't really have to spend a lot of time to manage your investments. I have an automatic investment plan and I literally just check in on it when I'm interested enough to, to do that. So it doesn't need to be time consuming. It doesn't need to be hard. Guys, I'm gonna. I can see some questions coming through. I'm gonna to come to them in a sec. Keep those questions coming through. Uh, just talking about next steps, though. I uh, wanted to share this example. It talks about replacing your income with investing. I started unpacking this through when I wrote my book, Replace Your Salary by Investing. Median income in Australia is ninety-two thousand dollars. The rough rule of thumb when it comes to investments is that you should be able to draw five percent from a portfolio of investments as an income without eating into capital. That means if you wanted to receive an investment income of $92,000 a year, you'd need to have about $1.84 million in an investment portfolio to deliver that to you for the rest of your life. So to say it a different way, if you had $1.84 million in a share portfolio today, I'd be pretty confident I could deliver you $92,000 into your bank account every year indefinitely. That's based on the long-term share market return and then allowing for inflation, taxes, fees, um, and then the income that you pay out. Now, how much you need to save and invest to get to build that $1.84 million depends on when you start. If you start when you're 20, you need to save $10.10 a day. Twenty-seven. Uh, if you're 30, you need to save $27.72 a day. If you're 40, $81 a day, 50, $296 a day. So you see that the sooner you get started, the less you have to do. If you're 20, $10 a day, most people could do that. $27 a day, that's getting harder. That's 200 bucks a week, but it's something that would be achievable for most people. At 40 though, $80 a day, you're talking about $500 a week now, 560 bucks. That's a chunk of change. And $296 a day, $2,100 a week, that is going to be pretty, most people don't earn that much, let alone have the ability to save that much. So sort of talk to this point in this model that when you think about getting from where you are to future state when it comes to your money you people think about it like a straight line but it's actually in the in the future you're going to be in one of four positions ranging from not very good to to really good now when people think about getting from where they are to where they want to be that uh, they think about it like a straight line, but it's actually not a straight line because of the compounding impact of time and money. It's actually a curve. So if you're not 100% on track to end up exactly where you want to be with your money, you need to actually do some stuff and jump the line. And once you do, you just need to then take the next step and the next step and the next step, which is easier because you are already on the path. But the more time goes on, the jumping the line bit becomes the work you need to do gets harder and it gets more and more painful and putting yourself in the best position can become impossible because the sacrifice you need to make is just too great. So then people end up settling. So this is my motivation talk to say the sooner you get started, the easier it is. You saw it in the numbers in that previous example. You can see it here. This is how it works. That if you if money success to you is five grand a month of investment income and your dream home paid off, you need to save a certain amount of money today. If you wait a week, a month, a year, five years, you just need to save more and invest more to end up in the same position. So guys, uh, I hope you found that helpful. I'll leave you this quote from Derek Sivers. It says, if information was the answer, we'd all be billionaires with perfect abs. Now, I hope you guys have got a bunch of great ideas out of today, but now it's time to take action to make it happen. Now, guys, uh, this is obviously our jam. This is this is what we do. So I've actually just put, uh, oh, actually, that's the wrong way. Let me just change that. Um, that is link oh it's here so this is our jam this is what we help people with so if you wanted to chat about how we can help we do these 10 minute intro phone calls where uh literally just like what are the opportunities for you what um what are the roadblocks that might be slowing you down or holding you back and then what can you do to actually move move things forward if we think we can help we can talk about how if we don't think we can we can point you in the right direction now, here it is. I just found the 
right link. I'm just going to pop this into the chat. Uh, so if you want to book a call, you can book that here. Uh, if, yeah, like I said, if we, if we don't think we can help, we can point you in the right direction. And guys, I'm happy to stick around. I'm mindful of time, but I'm, I can see that there's a couple of questions here. So I'm just going to try and fire these off as well. Uh, David says, should I be investing in super rather than my own name? Look, what, it's hard for me to answer that question without giving you financial advice, but I will say that investing in super rather than your own name will mean that you pay a lot lower rate of tax. Um, so yeah, there's a tax saving there, but investing in super in super money, um, investing in super means that the money is trapped there until you're old. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Uh, so you need to just strike that balance. It means that it's probably not going to be the first strategy that you go to, but it's also not going to be the last. Question says, what do you mean by wealthy people? Uh, I mean people that are wealthy. So like, I suppose if the question is how much wealth do you need to be wealthy? Look, to ha basically to, to have the average income, like have enough investments to deliver you the median income in Australia and to own your own home outright with no mortgage, you need about $3 million, which I think means that you're pretty wealthy. Like I reckon if you've got $3 million worth of assets, to me, that's pretty wealthy. Um, but that is the average income and the average New South Wales property price. So some people would say, well, that's not wealthy. Well, I think that's pretty wealthy. But I suppose it's, it's a little bit like how long is a piece of string. Rick says, can you invest without a bank account? Uh, you, I think that would be possible but I don't know why you would want to firstly. And I don't know where you'd receive your investment income into. That's a bit of a random one, Rick, but thank you for that. Uh, question, Rochelle, who do, I, who do I talk to or what resources are there to discuss an investment strategy? So if you book a call through the link that I've put into the chat, someone you'll talk to with one of the relationship managers at our team and they can talk to you about how to invest and how it works. We also have a, um, a group training and coaching solution service that uh, helps people with this stuff as well. Um, you can check that out on the Pivot Wealth website under the Smart Money Accelerator. They can give you some more information on that or you can check it out on the website. That's a basically an end-to-end -end investing game plan. Well, guys, uh, I hope you found that helpful. Now you got the plan. It's over to you to take action. Uh, check out our upcoming events as well. I've actually got this on a slide, socials, uh, whatever, bunch of content out there. Uh, appreciate all the thanks coming through, guys. You are all very welcome. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you use it to get results, and I'll catch you next time. Bye for now, team.